Uh, on June 18th, Robert Morris resigned from his role as senior pastor of Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and is no longer serving as the apostolic and overseeing area, uh, uh, elder here at Gateway Church Houston. Uh, that role as an apostolic elder was really to give wisdom and guidance as I needed it. Um, uh, and that, and that's, that was very important to be able to note. Robert Morris and Cindy, okay? NBC has an audio, okay? This was a phone conversation that took place between Cindy and Robert Morris, okay? So we're going to go through the transcript because this is where these people are talking back and forth. So I read, Robert Morris, a pastor and the founder of Gateway Church, wanted to know what it was going to take to prevent the woman on the phone from going public with the accusation that he had abuse her as a child okay so i'm skipping certain words because we are on this platform put a price on it and i called put a price on it maury said on september 20 uh, september 22 2005 according to a document that appears to be a transcript of a phone call the document was provided to nbc news by a former gateway staff member so clearly it seems that some people are, uh, you know, they are gateway members who are not happy of uh, what is going on, okay? So, yes, they are putting uh, the issues out. So, you know, we are here and we're going to uh, talk about it, okay? So, I continue. Uh, put a price on it, okay? So, I'm like, what type of talk is this? Now... Uh, a document that appears to be a transcript of phone call, the document was provided to NBC News by a former Gateway staff member. It is not a small number. The woman, Cindy Kremesha, responded. According to the transcript, and I quote, money doesn't make you happy, and I can understand that. So that is not what this is about. Morris again pressed her to name a figure. Quote, $2 million, Kremesha said. The transcript shows. A moment later, Morris ended the conversation. Nearly two more decades would pass before Kremesha spoke publicly about the years of abuse she says Morris inflicted on her in the 1980s, beginning when she was 12. In response to Kremesha's account, first published on June 14 by the church watchdog site, the Wardberg Watch, Morris confessed in a statement to inappropriate dash behavior. Morris who saved on a former Morris who saved on a former president Donald Trump's spiritual advisory board resigned last week from Gateway, the mega church in South Lake, Texas. He founded 24 years ago. NBC previously reported on a series of emails between Kremesha and Morris sent from April to October 2005 in which she asked him to compensate her for her trauma. So, clearly, as you can see, uh, this conversation was going on even prior. Things are just coming out now, but there were things uh, that were going on before all this, okay? So, uh, let's continue to read. We are almost done uh, with, uh, with the article, okay? Uh, 23 years after, you began destroying my life. So this is Cindy Kremesha, according to NBC. 23 years after you began destroying my life, I'm still dealing with the pain and damage you caused. Kremesha, 35, at the time, wrote on September 20, 2005, I want some type of restitution, okay? Keep that word in mind. I want some type of restitution. Pray about it and call me. So uh, that's uh, Cindy Kremesha at the age 12 with her older sister, okay? So the young one here is uh, Cindy Kremesha. Two days later, Morris and his wife, Debbie Morris, called Kremesha according to the transcript obtained by NBS News. Kremesha initially told NBC News last week that Morris hadn't called her in 2005. But after reviewing the transcript, she said she now remembered the conversation. NBC News has not heard the audio. The document is based, is based on and does not know who made the recording or produced the transcript. 
the document titled Transcription of Recorded Phone Conversation with Cindy Kremersher. Okay, so that's the title that's on there. We continue. Was provided to NBC News by a former member of Gateway's IT department. The worker said he discovered the, mis the Microsoft Word document more than a decade ago while transferring files from Morris' computer to a new laptop. The IT worker shared the transcript on the condition that he not be named. Mm, so that would be, well, fine. He's a whistleblower. All right, we continue. The document sat for years on a shared server at Gateway that primarily held archival sermon notes and was accessible to members of Gateway's technology teams. The worker said, Metadata from the document shows it was created on October 19, 2007, about two years after the call. At a time when Kremisha said she and Morris were negotiating a possible legal settlement that never materialized. The file was created by someone who listed the title as court administrator, cause court, and, comp and company as court gateway church and has not been modified since the day it was created according to its metadata. So many questions, okay? And I also have questions we can understand. But this has been provided by NBS. The, uh, the person doesn't want to be named. That is fine. But what is not in dispute is well, Cindy forgot about it. But then when she was uh, asked by NBS, she does record the conversation. And I remember the pastor who was interviewed by Justin Peters actually said that he did recall uh, the, the, the amount about two million. So this actually shows that, yes, this conversation took place between Robert and Cindy. Uh, so from the transcript, I think Boris did not want to pay the two, uh, even the, the, the two million. And then we already did this video before where... Morris was saying like, okay, if I give you this money, it, my lawyer advised not to give you this money because it will be considered as blackmail. Legally speaking, lawyers do advise their clients that. That is true. That if you pay somebody, then uh, who's to, who's to, they might come back next time that they want more. What are you going to do? If you pay for the first time, they expect you to pay a second time, whether the person comes or not. So what I'm I'm wondering is why didn't uh, to me it looks like Cindy did not have a representation during this time but if she had a lawyer and then the lawyer are negotiating this amount I don't think it would have been a problem then they would have just settled this right but I guess she was doing this on her own and then you're communicating directly with Robert there was no any representation on her part so uh I don't, th you know, she was young. I guess she just did, you know, she didn't know any better and everything else. But that's, you know, th this is uh, exactly what happened. Okay. So according to her, she wanted restitution. Okay. There's nothing wrong in you wanting restitution. Okay. Restitution is biblical. You can, oh, you can forgive somebody, okay, and the, 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 this is what you have in the Levitical rule, right? This is exactly what happened to Zacchaeus, right? Okay, I'm going to give back the people that I have stolen. Okay, so you're asking people to forgive you, and then you're giving them back, right? So the scripture will require double fold. So let's say, I don't know, you steal someone else's, I don't know, um, a cell phone, right? You steal someone else's cell phone, you're going to give them back the cell phone, you're going to give them back the value of the cell phone, times two you always double it right that way the person does not seek revenge because vengeance belongs to god so that's why when people you're giving them back you always give them back what was required and then some right that way things are settled obviously this is done uh, in a court of law so to speak so yes according to the law did she you know should uh morris have given her restitution yes because the case, whatever happened, right, that requires the, the actual sentence will be death penalty, right? Restitution plus death penalty. But we don't believe in those things. So, yes, restitution will go. So, it will just, it will be a calculation where, but like, she was 12 years old, right? So, I'm sure, like, okay, what you took from her, 
she can never get that back okay it can never be replaced so the value of that is uh you cannot put a price on it however you know if these people wanted to go to court and settle the matters you can do that right people always settle matters you know against whatever the scripture says ethan fisher okay ethan fisher is the senior pastor at gateway church in houston who is married to elaine fisher so elaine is robert morris's daughter okay so these two are married and this gentleman is a senior pastor at Gateway Church, okay? And obviously, like we demonstrated that they are right, they are keeping everything uh, in the family, okay? So this is not uh, different. So now, they also had to speak on it because Robert Morris was an, an apostle of all Gateway Churches, <laughs> okay? So now that he has stepped down, this is his son-in-law. He has to speak to his congregation. But then that's his father-in-law. I mean, it's all complicated, right? Because they like to keep everything in the family. So let's listen in to what he said to his congregation, okay? Here we go. Uh, this past week, I just wanted to share my heart and obviously care for us and bring comfort uh, as much as I possibly can. Uh, there, these are questions, as I share, that I really have asked myself as I've navigated during this time and process and my hope is that I can bring clarity and comfort the best way that I can, and obviously guided by the Holy Spirit in order to be able uh, to do so. Uh, as I took the time this week to find the perfect words, I realized it was very hard to find the perfect words when you're at a loss for words. And really just but my prayers that I can extend comforting words over this past week. Uh, we have been uh, obviously grieved and shocked over uh, the child sexual abuse allegations that have been brought to light regarding uh, Robert Morris. Uh, for years, he has shared about a moral failure early on in his marriage, but prior to this past week, uh, the leadership, including myself and even Elaine, with the leadership here at Gateway Church Houston, and I have all the facts regarding uh, the allegations. And like many of you, uh, we have now been made aware of the age of the victim and even the length of the abu abuse that happened. Uh, on June 18th, Robert Morris resigned from his role as senior pastor of Gateway Church in the Dallas-Fort Worth area and is no longer serving as the apostolic and overseeing area, uh, uh, elder here at Gateway Church Houston. Uh, that role as an apostolic elder was really to give wisdom and guidance as I needed it. Um, uh, and and that's, that was very important to be able to note. Uh, from its launch, from the church's launch, uh, Gateway Church Houston is operated not as a campus, but as an autonomous church, both legally and financially, for those that may not be aware. And as a senior pastor, I lead the board of elders that govern the church, provide vision, initiatives, direction, and even accountabilities we seek to fulfill the mission that God has given us as a church to reach the greater Houston area. And I am grateful for all that Gateway Church and the Dallas-Fort Worth area has done to support us uh, in the calling that God has placed on our lives. Uh, one of the questions I've asked myself during this time is, how should I feel? I'm sure you may have asked that question. There's many feelings that you know, you're obviously processing. There's many feelings that um, we have processed as well, even as a family. And the truth is, we should feel whatever we feel. I think many times we could try to run away from our feelings, but that never lead, leads to healing in any capacity. There's a reason there's a book of lamentations in the Bible, where there's a lament, there's a crying out, there's a weeping that is happening whenever there is brokenness in humanity, especially when it hits close to home. And then even in Ecclesiastes, it tells us there's a time to cry and there is a time to mourn. And Jeremiah, 3, Jeremiah 8 verse 21, it says this, since, since my people are crushed, I am crushed. I mourn and horror grips me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is there no healing for the wound of my people? And the place that there was supposed to be healing was actually the place that there was ultimate pain. And he's wondering why isn't there a healing presence of what God can bring in that moment. Okay. So notice, um, notice one thing that's so clear, okay, in how he studied this right this gentleman right uh fisher he is a senior pastor okay so if you're going to speak to the congregation you have to speak to the congregation as a senior pastor but he is very conflicted which i understand right because of that's his father-in-law but this is a problem now just like okay you know what i mean your family is your family and now this is a church you need to be you need to say the words so if you're he he, ne he never mentioned the name okay he never mentioned the name 
He never mentioned, uh, you know, Cindy Kremesha just said, oh, I know how you guys are feeling. It is hard, but we can be cute. Like, you know, like just a feel good message. Like, no, you have to be upfront with this because, you know, that is also gateway church. You see what I'm saying? And maybe I can understand like, okay, you know, it's, you are just a, a different church, but it's not the same, but that guy is an apostle of your church. So I don't know what you guys think. You think, you know, maybe let's listen to some more, but to me so far, it's just like, I mean, we need some more meat on this. Okay. So let's listen a little bit more and then we'll, uh, we'll continue. A grieving is actually making space for the feelings that you are experiencing uh, in the moment. Sin will always lead to sadness and a broken heart. Whatever, whether the feelings are feelings of hurt, uh, they could be feelings of devastation, feelings of anger, uh, feelings of disappointment, betrayal, confusion, disbelief, shock, or even just simply surprise. Uh, the truth is I've felt all of these feelings over the past week. Uh, and they kind of come in waves. And the grief comes in waves. And, and what we've had to navigate, and I really have grieved for my family personally, uh, but I also grieve uh, for you as a church and I pray for you a countless number of times. I know that situations like this also bring up painful memories of past experiences. In a church our size, I know that there are many others who have a story of experiencing the harm, trauma, and pain of abuse. The truth is you've carried a weight with you that you should never have been placed on you, or what should have never been done to you. And as a pastor, I'm sincerely sorry for the pain that you have carried for so long, especially if that pain has come at the hands of pastors. As a church, our desire is to come alongside you to be a part of the journey of healing. I believe we serve a God who can restore our souls even in the midst of unimaginable suffering and pain. And practically as a church, we want to come alongside you to be able to help you in the journey toward healing. Um, at both locations, there'll be a place where you can go in the service at Guest Central. You can grab a car, but you can also email care at gatewayhome.com and we'll connect you with resources and counselors because I don't want all these feelings to just come up and not us be able to get the healing that we need. About seven months ago, I went through a vocal surgery. And the truth is, I know how hard it is to be silent uh, for just a Okay, I hope you guys have picked up. This guy is speaking to his congregation. He's apologizing, but he, he's not mentioning anybody's name. He didn't mention anybody's name. So who are you specifically apologizing to and saying that, okay, you guys, I know that you're going through pain and everything. I, I, it is devastating for the church, for their church for sure, okay? But to me, I'm like, okay, at least the other elder was addressed, uh, you know, addressed Cindy. You know what I mean? Say so we're praying for Cindy. Everybody's affected. They just went on. But this guy, to me, uh, if you're sitting there, right, like, if you don't know, how will you know what he's talking about? Because he could have said these things, I mean, like, you know, th six months ago, four months ago. So we know that whatever he's talking about, it is in reference to Robert Morris. But he cannot even get himself to mention Robert Morris's name. So to me, I'm like, you know, if you're going to do this, then just do it p p privately. Because to me, you know, he, he's rem he, he does sound remorseful, but I don't know. Am I being hard on him? Because it's, it's falling short, in my opinion. <laughs> I can't even begin to imagine what it's been like for those who have been silent and carried the pain for decades. There are times in life when you face circumstances that are not your fault, but you can step in and take responsibility and lead people towards healing and hope. And as a church and me personally, I'm committed to being a voice for those who may have felt like they've been voiceless for so long. I've wrestled with many questions while trying to find answers. The hardest part is that every answer only seems to lead to more questions for me. And it may be the same for you as well. Elaine and I were processing it, obviously, as family. Elaine is a daughter, and I've done my best to be there for her. Me as a, a, a son-in-law, we're processing the pain in real time in the same way I know many of you are. Uh, we're having to navigate tough conversations with our children uh, around uh, this conversation and shedding tears as we process with them. Many of you know we have a daughter who's 10 and a daughter who's 9 and having to navigate the emotions and trying to do our best to care for them. Uh, we, we've lived in this tension of loving a person while at the same time knowing there are consequences to actions. God is love and he is also just. While forgiveness is available, there are also many times costs to our decisions. Uh, Elaine and I are, are doing our best to pursue healing and turn to the Lord during this time. We want to be able to lead and love God and his people for a long time, and we know that something like this can rock 
the faith of many of you can also hinder the purity of our hearts. This is why we're proactively pursuing counseling uh, with trusted people and wholeness that can only be found in God. And that really is the posture that we've had to take during this time as people have asked us, hey, how are you doing? Uh, I'll just tell them, well, it's been a nightmare week. Uh, what we've had to process and what we've had to go through, but we know that we, we will get the help. And, and truth be told, I'm, I just simply want to say thank you to every person who has reached out to us. And I know that you have been praying for us, uh, praying for the church, praying for us individually as a family. And I want to say I, we appreciate it. That's really what's truly carried us uh, during this past week. Uh, for us and many of us, this is unprecedented. And uh, we appreciate the love, we appreciate the support, and we appreciate the way that you cared for us. Uh, I know many pastors and even many leaders and even longtime friends have reached out to us during this time uh, that has been difficult, and that's what's really been able to encourage us to lift our spirits to continue walking. Another question that I've asked myself, and you may be asking yourself as well, is how do I respond? How do we respond during this time? And for me, I come back to the thing that's always been true by focusing on Jesus. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. And since he is the one writing our stories, we can trust his pen, even in the midst of not understanding everything that is happening. Because I've learned that while our feelings may move us, it's ultimately our faith in Jesus that anchors us. It gives us what we need to be able to move forward. And as we draw near to him in our grief and our pain, he promises to be near to us and bring us comfort and hope. Psalm 94 verse 19 says, when doubt filled my mind, your comfort gave me renewed hope and cheer. And ultimately, right now, we need the hope that can only come from Jesus. In this season, I'm doing my best to not let my disappointment turn into resentment. And I know that's a very easy path towards that. The way that I've done this and the way I want to encourage you to do this is by guarding our hearts. Guard the thoughts that come, the, the thoughts that the enemy would give, the thoughts that we're processing, even our own pain that we navigate through. See, times like this can be disorienting, but we must not let the enemy strike our faith in God. Galatians 6.1 tells us, dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. To me, the key here. Okay, so this is actually, I mean, it's scriptures, okay? This is the same scripture that, it, it's scriptures, I'm just adding this, okay? The same scripture that Robert Morris love to quote when he was restoring uh mark driscoll so i'm like okay <laughs> so now we have the son-in-law uh quoting the same scripture so yes it as far as their family is concerned there this, this is a big deal okay so the word is allegedly uh robert morris's wife whenever she asked what what was up with uh whatever the meetings with Cindy, the response was Robert Morris was telling her that, oh, I'm canceling Cindy. I'm canceling Cindy. Okay. So that was uh, how he was just waiting in that he was canceling Cindy. The focus is on the right path, not a position. The path is a path that is uh, of humility. It's, it's a path of repentance. It's a path of confession. It's a hard path, but it ultimately leads to life. It leads to righteousness. And it's a path that leads to God. It's a path that leads to giving every single one of us a hope, and a future. We also need to respond with integrity and honesty. It says for us to consider ourselves, to look at ourselves. Psalm 32, 3 through 5, David writes this. He says, when I refuse to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night, your hand of discipline was on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confess all my sins to you and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. This verse is a sobering reminder for all of us to consider. Where do we stand? If there's anything in our lives that we're caring and hiding that's hindering relationship with God, we need to confess it because God is a God who still forgives. And I also want to encourage you that we respond to this by being in community. It's very easy whenever life hits you to isolate yourself. And isolation with grief can be very dangerous because it can warp our perspective. It can even hinder us from seeing what God wants to do even in that moment. I do agree. Uh, I do agree with what he said, biblically speaking, because 
yes, you don't want to be uh, in isolation for sure. So I guess this is how they're, you know, they're trying their best to uh, move forward. But I took a note how he distanced himself, like, okay, at the beginning, right? Like we are, uh, yes, we are Gateway Church, but we are independent church. We are our own church. We are not a satellite church. Uh, Robert Morris was just, you know, an overseer. In a way, like, you know, it was just a title. It was just a title. But would this guy have this position as a senior pastor of Gateway Church in Houston if it wasn't for Robert Morris? Okay, so he is in a very predicament situation. That's his father-in-law. They also have little ones. That's, uh, I mean, it's complicated. Okay, so this is what happens. Sin affects you. And it's going to affect the people around you, okay? The things that you did, right, or everything that you did in darkness, right? That's why it says it's all going to come to the light. So now all the families that are going to be implicated in this, right? The dynamics, the relationships, and then people are thinking like, oh, I remember my kids, you know, they went to their house. Oh, you, they went to their grandpa. I mean, all these other things. How are you going to be asking like, oh, grandpa, I just, you know, father-in-law, I just wanted to make sure. Have you, you know what I mean? Like it's... It's, it's complicated.